Hi friends, preparing for this deep dive, the focus on joining a group. I was reminded of a story I read recently in a blog post. A young man in graduate school was struggling with questions about his future and about the future of the field of study, about his faith, about the social ills he observed around him, and about the ethical challenges he already had encountered and knew would only get worse with time. The young man was a Christian, and yet the Bible didn't seem to speak to his questions directly. And prayers seemed to get lifted up, but somehow stuck on the ceiling and never reaching the ears of God. Practicing his faith, he reasoned, was easier when he was with his family, but it was put on hold during the time that he was in school and until he completed his degree. That's what he anticipated. I don't know if that sounds like anything you've experienced, but it certainly sounds like life as I've known it as well. A friend invited him to join a small group, an accountability group. An 18th century document was written by a guy named John Wesley, and it was given to him, and he read it and discovered that this group also had a name. It was called a band and a purpose to watch over one another in love. Now, let me describe the story a little further. I, I will tell you, but I'm gonna stop for a moment, actually. I'm gonna pause and tell you instead about the ways that we commit to a group and find ourselves growing in discipleship. In fact, I think it's very important to commit to a group if we're serious about Christian discipleship. You'll remember the definition of discipleship is continuously and intentionally becoming more Christ-like and introducing others to Christ. What kind of group can help us do that? become more Christ-like? Well, there are many. Sunday school classes, Bible studies, topical studies, all are a means of growth. Content and information conveyed uh, by a teacher and offering insight into Jesus' character and ministry and even the way Jesus formed disciples, all of these things help us to grow in our knowledge and understanding of discipleship. We see how the first church, following the Pentecost event, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, gathered believers in small groups. We understand they met mostly in homes because the church was persecuted. And we find in Acts, the second chapter, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So all of those groups that offer teaching and discovery, as, as we've said, are opportunities for growth. A prayer group may also be gathered or connected by phone or the internet as participants agree to pray for members of the community and for the concerns those members present. I know of one church that would identify prayer triplets as the source of the church's transformation from conflicted to united. It was a remarkable change. Groups of three were invited and then organized for a set season of prayer about the church's future. And for a hundred days, these small groups of only three per group prayed individually and then met together, just the three, once a week. And they grew to love one another. And as they listened deeply to each other and to God, they found hope and vision for their church. Some of the prayer triplets are still meeting weekly, and they have been since 2014. Affinity groups offer fascinating and practically endless possibilities for discipleship. Any common interest may bring together a group. It might be cooking or gardening or parenting or running or knitting. It could be anything. It could be auto mechanics. The group may incorporate their shared interest into a plan for mission. For example, knitting lap blankets 
for members of assisted living centers became the mission of an affinity group that enjoyed needlework. We also find opportunities for runners to both contribute to their own fitness, but also contribute to the needs of the community through events like our very own Wrightsville United Methodist Church Sun Run. These are examples of the benefits of affinity groups and shared faith and shared interests are the springboard for ministry as disciples of Jesus Christ. I found in these months of social distancing that I want and need community. Let me say that a little more clearly. I crave community. I want and need conversation partners to help me sort out feelings and beliefs and all kinds of things about what's happening, about what's not happening in our country, about how we can or cannot, as followers of Christ, make a difference. For me, Participating in the racial unity group and especially in Be the Bridge study has been incredibly fulfilling. All of us as participants claim that we struggle to understand racism. We confess our ignorance and complicity in the racial injustice that continues to divide us to this day. We all are works in progress. We all are motivated by belief in God's word that all are created in God's image. We desire a community that's marked by justice, peace, hope, love. And while we want this kind of community, we know it will be hard to realize that vision. In fact, we probably wouldn't agree on how to get there. But the conversation goes on and we listen, we learn, and we love one another. We pray for God to show us that still more excellent way to live. And I'm confident that we'll hear from God. Now you can join a group or several groups, and there are lots of options at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. But I ask, can we go a little deeper? This is the day of the deep dive. Can we go back to the story of the young graduate student who was invited to join a group, an accountability group. Notice first that he was invited. We can't separate last month's emphasis in our deep dive, an emphasis on invitation, from this month's focus on joining a group. The invitation to community is based on the foundation of our life in God. We are made for community, as God reflects community in the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And further, discipleship is not a solitary experience. We thrive in hospitable environments where we're made to feel that we belong. All of these are important in one who is invited to join a community. Invited to join a community and to grow in Christ likeness. So far, so good. And as this young man responded to the invitation, he discovered that participants in the group also were expected to become vulnerable. And if they would extend themselves in vulnerability, they would experience grace, forgiveness, and love unlike any experience of these before. He was invited into a process that would help him to understand the cost of discipleship. Now, the purpose of the group, as we've said, is to watch over one another in love. And Jesus modeled this watching over one another in his relationship to the 12. We lifted up the vision for this kind of group experience as it's described in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and discover there that the believers were devoted to God, devoted to one another, and they engaged the teaching of the, the apostles. They participated in table fellowship and in prayer, and they even shared their possessions with other members of their community when one had a need. Now, last month, I recall John Wesley's review of his own life 
And in comparing his life to the life of Jesus, Wesley felt that he was misdirecting his time. And so he hit the reset button and organized small groups that he called classes and still smaller groups that he called bands to encourage believers to watch over one another in love. In his adoption of this spiritual discipline, he turned to the group which offered both opportunity and challenge, both grace and accountability. Small groups, much like Jesus' disciples, the 12 followers and then his inner circle of three who experienced even more of the highest and lowest moments of Jesus' ministry. What happens in a class meeting? As people gather, committed to God and to one another, the participants ask at the beginning of their weekly meeting, how is it with your soul? Now they don't want answers that just sound nice. Oh, I'm fine. They don't want false piety. Oh, I see God in everything I do. No, typically the seven to 12 who were involved in the class meeting offered honest reflections and received honest guidance. The meeting included prayers for one another that each one may grow in their knowledge and love of Christ. How is it with your soul? Last week, I was facilitating the onboarding of a pastor to his key lay leadership team in his newly um, in his new appointment. And in a conversation about what the church expected of their pastor, one man uh, described his own uh, uh, immediate context in his neighborhood, and he said. On one side of my house, a neighbor has a sign in the front yard that says Black Lives Matter. On the other side, my neighbor tells me how much he hates to see protests in the streets and destruction of property and loss of confidence in the local police forces. Now, he really isn't talking about our own relatively quiet community, but about the things that we see in the news. But you can imagine, folks, how this man in the middle was struggling to know what to say, what to do, as he wants to love both of his neighbors and to reflect the light of Jesus in the midst of a tense time. So he said to the new pastor, I long for support and guidance in my walk with Christ. Discipleship doesn't happen in isolation. We need one another. We need others to encourage us, challenge us, and walk with us. And that's what a class meeting will do for one another. Now, bands are more intense, and they require more vulnerability than class meetings. Typically, a group of three to seven persons focused on reconciliation to God and to others. So imagine this as the question you face when you begin your meeting as a band. What sins have you committed since our last meeting? Confessing is encouraged in the scriptures. In the letter of James, for example, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Notice that confessing wasn't intended to bring shame to anyone, but to help the disciple find freedom from guilt and healing of broken relationships. And members of the bands were encouraged by Paul's words to the Ephesians as well, knowing that some of us have a way to go to be able to claim maturity in our faith. Paul envisioned mutual respect, mutual accountability among the followers of Christ, and he encouraged Speaking the truth in love, these are Paul's words, speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, 
the Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Isn't that what we do when we confess and forgive, when we confess and, and experience the grace of others in our group? Wesley called this process of maturing in faith, sanctification. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit in us, working to root out the temptation to judge or to gossip, or to envy, or to ignore the cry of the needy. The student who entered into the small group with a degree of fear and trepidation describes his experience now. Looking back, he writes, that group was where I was reminded of just how amazing God's grace really is, where I was encouraged to grow in holiness, and where I received scripture's promise of forgiveness through the words of a brother in Christ. The experience awakened in me a desire for deep Christian community and showed the possibilities for growth in Christ that come from investing in another's lives. These are the words of Dr. Kevin Watson, associate professor at Candler School of Theology. And as I understand it, his initial steps into graduate school are not the place, did, did not take him to where he ended up. It was largely this experience of an accountability group, a band, that led him to this place of faith and teaching. Now, I don't want to miss this opportunity to share with you the benefits of a small group experience. Most of us learn better in group settings. This is known, studies have concluded that we wrestle with questions, we express our views among others on a similar quest, and we tend to grow as we find solutions to problems. It doesn't matter what the context or the content may be. We all learn, well, not all, but most learn better in group settings. The first 80 years of American Methodism represent one of the most explosive growths in the history of world Christianity. Could it happen again through small groups in the 21st century? As Wesleyan Christians, small groups are in our DNA. Let's be reminded of what Wesley saw in his own experience and what we see in scripture. Again, in Acts chapter 2, the 47th verse, this group that had devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles, those who had devoted themselves to prayer and to the breaking of bread together, and whose lives were so very loving in that they would share of their possessions to anyone who had need among them. Then we read, they ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Now, folks, we may think it wouldn't work now, that values, culture, a whole lot of things have changed. And it's true. We've experienced changes upon changes in the last 20 years. But it was a very joyful fellowship that gathered to confess and to hold one another accountable. It was a very joyful fellowship that experienced renewal and growth, even when they were being challenged by persecution and by the honesty of one another, speaking the truth in love. It was through small groups that the early church and Wesley's participants in many and many in recent days have learned how to really love their neighbor and to uphold the commandment to love. No excuses, no exceptions. So how is it with your soul? To be perfectly honest with you, my soul is withering. Eight months of limited interaction with people has taken a toll on me and on my spiritual life. And I too am losing friends to this horrible virus. It's not easy, 
I miss community. I miss the deep dive discussions with you. I long to simply be with you. How is it with your soul? Is this a good time for you to seek out a study group that meets on Zoom? Is this a time when you would grow if you could offer help and hope in one of the mission areas of our church? Is this a time to form a prayer triplet or to call a couple of other withering souls to join you in a band or a class meeting? If you want to take a step toward discipleship growth through a group, resources are available, opportunities are abundant. Watch over one another in love, my friends, and may God be with you always. Amen.